It is truly nice to, to be here the, this evening, and I've been looking forward to my trip to Indianapolis and to the IMA because I um, am familiar with IMA. I've not been here before. I, of course, have heard of it over the years, and I've had a, a wonderful day of immersion into all things IMA with uh, the staff and Charles's colleagues here, and in particular with um, the talented horticultural professionals. And I have to say that um, I think that um, all of you have a real jewel here in the grounds and the landscape and the opportunities that it um, will afford you and provide this institution in, in the future. I think it's really very exciting, not only for you, but for all of us in the profession and watching from, from afar. And so I know that Charles and I are going to talk in a, a few moments and have a casual conversation about Longwood and, and life in general, I guess. And so I just want to um, take a few moments to introduce Longwood to you. And this is quite the challenge because this is usually a 45 minute presentation and I'm gonna do it really quickly for you. Um, because the most important thing is I just want you to, to have a feel for what we're about at Longwood and the legacy that we have, which is monumental and really how we're trying to make a difference in the world. And, and the thing that, um, that best summarize what, summarizes what we're trying to accomplish at Longwood, it's about um, providing a beautiful experience for all of our guests. Um, there are many kinds of gardens around the world. We were talking about this this afternoon. There's botanical gardens, there's research gardens, there's academic gardens, you, you name it. Um, we're all those things. But um, first and foremost, we're about the beauty that we're creating 365 days a year. And uh, it's something that we like to say that we're not bashful about being beautiful. And we're actually very, very proud of the beauty that we're creating. Because if we do this right, um, we are entering or providing a world for our million plus guests that is really truly a world apart from, from all others. And I think in this day and age, it's something that we all need. So the legacy of, of Longwood, it goes back really to, to one guy, Pierre DuPont, um, but it actually predates um, Mr. Mr. DuPont. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the DuPont family, you're probably familiar with the name of the, the company, but the DuPont family um, is really an extraordinary group um, because um, they really are the patron saints of horticulture in the United States. Um, the Brandywine Valley in the Philadelphia area in Delaware is filled with some of the, the grandest and most beautiful gardens I think there are in our country. And there are many, many plant societies, plant societies that some of you are probably engaged in and involved in that I promise you the DuPonts and various DuPont family members had their fingers in founding those various organizations. I know orchids are very important to you and here in your, your greenhouses. Mr. DuPont's wife, Alice DuPont, actually was one of the founding members of the American Orchid Society. So knowing that the DuPonts were the patron saints of horticulture, when it came time and the opportunity was provided for him to purchase a small tract of land in Pennsylvania in southeastern Chester County, um, it was really an easy decision for him. And the reason that he purchased this tract of land in southeastern Pennsylvania was to save a historic stand of trees. Um, these trees um, date pre-William pre Penn, but many of them were planted from a period of about 1730 all the way until 1906. There was a Quaker family by the name of Pierce's that lived on that land. So generations of the Pierce's lived on this land and they began creating an arboretum. And the name Longwood actually came from that period of time. So Mr. DuPont was living in Wilmington and he heard that this stand of historic trees were going to be sold for timber. And so in 1906, he, he did what he said was the craziest investment that a person could make at the time. He invested in real estate, but he was really investing in the trees to save these very trees. And many people don't realize that Mr. DuPont actually wrote one of the very first um, street tree protective ordinances in this country for Wilmington, Delaware in the early 20th century. 
So he purchased this tract of land in 1906, and from the very beginning, he set about to create what his vision of a great garden of the world would be. He traveled extensively throughout um, Europe. He visited all of the world's fairs of the late 19th century when he was a young man and he was maturing. And he was fascinated by the engineering marvels of the time and the technological marvels of, of the time. And he was also had this passion for horticulture. And he knew that he wanted to marry all of those interests of his in engineering and horticulture at Longwood Gardens. And so this is a, a postcard from our archives at Longwood. And this is of the Crystal Palace, the famed Crystal Palace in England. It was the largest conservatory or Crystal Palace or glass structure in the world at its time. He visited this. And I have no doubt whatsoever that it was this image of the beautiful Crystal Palace, the conservatories, the spectacle of the fountains and the fireworks is what inspired him for the Longwood that um, most of you know today. And I meant to ask you, have any of you been to Longwood before? So there are some of you that, that, that are familiar with Longwood. So today, Longwood is indeed a, a marriage of architecture, engineering, and horticulture. Um, as Charles was saying, we have close to 1,100 acres of, of gardens. We, in particular, have four acres of gardens under glass. And we also have miles and miles of fountains at Longwood. Um, that's that he was an engineer and chemist. He was fascinated, as I said earlier, of the technology of the time. Um, he would visit these world's fairs, and he would specifically ask to see how the fountains were being illuminated and how the fountains um, were being created. And he wanted to do the same at Longwood. He visited the great water gardens of Italy, and he actually copied two gardens and brought them back to Longwood and created them in his own version. But the main fountain garden that you see here was really his iconic water garden that he created in 1931, which I'll talk about that in, in the moment. Earlier, I mentioned about Longwood being about spectacle and the marriage of horticulture and engineering. Another important part of what we do at Longwood is entertainment. Um, Mr. DuPont had a very large family, many friends in the corporate world. Um, he was the CEO of the DuPont Company and of GM Motors at the same time. Um, he is um, credited with being the founder and the creator of the modern day corporation as we know it. And so he wanted to use Longwood to entertain his family and his friends and to immerse them into his beautiful world. And of that world um, that he was interested in was the performing arts, and in particular, organs. So one of the legacy items that we have at Longwood is the world's largest residential organ. And it's a 10,000 pipe organ that was installed in the ballroom in our conservatories to serve as the background music when you were strolling through the gardens under glass. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So what are we up to today and what is Longwood um, doing? Um, we're continuing our exploration of what defines a great garden in the 21st century. And a foundation of that is the gardens that we are collecting. So excellence in garden design is one of the pillars of our, our mission. And we are um, on um, a, um, we have a motivation to actually correct, to collect some of the gardens that have been designed by some of the most noted and accomplished landscape architects, landscape designers, and garden designers of the 20th and 21st century. And one of our recent um, gardens that we have collected was designed by a landscape architect of note from England by the name of Kim Wilkie. This is an, an astonishing, talented man. He works for Prince Charles. He did the master plan for the restoration of the River Thames estuary. I mean, he does monumental things, the very important things. He works within um, historic landscapes that were designed by Capability Brown. So you get the idea, he's an important person. And so we approached Kim Wilkie and we said, Kim, we have a very special project for you. Um, we would like for you to design restrooms for us. But we would like for them to have a horticultural theme. And so Kim said to us, you know, I've always wanted to do something that was inspired by the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul. And so we said, have at it. And from that, he designed um, this new restroom for facility for us that is the nation's largest living green wall. And the individual pods are replicas of the Topkapi Palace buildings. So you'll have to come and check this out. 
And then the horticultural displays, um, they are at the heart of what we do and, and really what many people know us for. Um, we have five seasons at Longwood, not four. And the, the work that goes into these displays is nothing less than astonishing. Um, right now, we're really here in about 10 days, um, we'll have over 300,000 um, spring flowering bulbs on display. And so that horticultural spectacle um, is something that we're always um, striving for to inspire people. And then, of course, the holiday season is really when we let it loose, and especially in the conservatories. It's our most popular time of year. A third of our visitation comes to Longwood over a course of 42 days, and that's when we really try to connect people to that Gatsby-era feeling of when our conservatories were created. But more recently, we have been embarking upon what we're focusing on with the natural lands outside of the perimeter of the very formal gardens that we have created recently and what our founder have, has le left us with. So of the, five, of the 1,100 acres that we have, 500 of it is actually in formal accessible gardens. The balance of that is actually in what we call land stewardship or land management. We have a holistic philosophy of land management and we refer to it as soil to sky. So we're managing the entire property of Longwood from everything that's below it to everything that's on top to everything that's in the air. And that's a whole other presentation unto itself. And so a new garden that we added just last summer was a new 90-acre meadow garden that um, I reference as a living Andrew Wyeth painting. This is quintessential Brandywine Valley. And we did this deliberately to connect people to that part of our mission of land conservation and land stewardship, but also to connect people to a very important part of the world in the Brandywine Valley. So when we look ahead to Longwood's future, you're going to be hearing more and more emphasis on marrying our horticulture interest with ecological, environmental, and land conservation interest as well. Horticultural research is the, the foundation of our horticultural displays. We travel around the world looking for new and different plants. We've introduced some 130 different plants into the commercial market, New Guinea patients, chrysanthemums, I could go on and on. We were just on an expedition to Vietnam where we collected some 500 plants in partnership with Kew Gardens and the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. Um, big stuff. Um, our interest is the horticultural display. Those other two organizations are in conservation of those plants. And with that research and conservation interest is also in the preservation of horticultural art forms. So I mentioned that chrysanthemums were of importance to us. We actually played a very important role of diversifying the species that are available here in the, the market in the United States. But it's the art form of chrysanthemums that really interests, on the, interests us on the display and on the display side. And we learned several years ago, this is about 10 years ago, we learned about this form of growing chrysanthemums called the, the thousand bloom chrysanthemum. Um, they grow these in Japan and they grow these in China. And they actually grow these in, in the mountains in near Fukushima, Japan. And it's actually a very small group of chrysanthemum masters that are continuing to grow this, a very special plant. In Japan, these can have upwards to 2,000 flowers on it. And so we decided to learn how to do this so that we could actually play a role in preserving this Asian art form and do it in our unique Longwood way. And I'm really proud because we have achieved this. And this is a product. This is a single stem chrysanthemum, one plant with over 1,500 individual flowers on it. Okay, the, another part of what we do at Longwood, and this is very important to me, and it's one of the reasons that, that I took the job at, at Longwood, in addition to my horticultural passion, of course, but it's the, the development of the next generation of um, horticultural professionals and, and talent. Um, at any, in any given time, we have upwards to 70 students at Longwood studying from around the world. Um, they're university and college interns that could be there for six months or 12 months. Um, we have a two-year apprenticeship that's the equivalent of an associate's degree in horticulture. And as Charles mentioned, we actually have a graduate program in horticulture as, as well. And so we're really working hard to fill that pipeline of horticulture talent. But we've also connected that to, guess what, our organ. And so we, we spent a lot of money and time investing in the complete restoration of this historic instrument and that's very important to us. 
And so we thought, how could we connect this to our mission in of developing the next generation of professional organists? So two years ago, we launched the Longwood Gardens International Organ Competition. This is for aspiring professional organists um, for the ages between 20 and 40. And the first prize is the PRS DuPont Prize, and it's a $40,000 cash prize, one year recording contract and agent representation. And so think of the Tchaikovsky Piano Competition or the Van Cliburn Piano Competition. That's what we're doing at Longwood Gardens with our organ. So our future, I showed you our fountain garden earlier. It is the heart and soul of Longwood. It was Mr. DuPont's um, final masterwork, I would say, that, that he created. And it was designed by, it was inspired by one of the most famous of the Italian water gardens in Italy at the Villa d'Este. And maybe some of you have, have seen the, the wall of fountains here. But he came back to Longwood, and this is his notation of designing this, this garden. And, uh, and we have embarked upon the complete and total restoration of this six-acre garden. Um, on the left, um, you'll see what it looked like up until October of last year, and you'll see what our future of it will be, um, what the future will be for it and how it will look in 2017. This is a $90 million project that we're embarking upon. So all of you will have to place this on your list of things to do in 2017 to, to come visit. So if you've learned anything about Longwood, I, I hope in this short time that you can see that it's a, really for us, it's about the, the beauty and the inspiration that um, we're trying to create today and also which is stewarding us well into the future. So thank you. I think we're going to have some mics for questions from the audience. I, I would like to sort of lead off because when you look at these, at least when I look at these pictures of these extraordinary chrysanthemum displays, mm -hmm. acres under glass, I mean, you could easily, I think, say, well, that's really great, but what exactly does that have in common with, with the grounds and the gardens here at the, here at the INA? But certainly there are some very interesting similarities, just the fact that basically Longwood is also the former estate of a, of a wealthy family that created something wonderful out of that. And we, of course, have the legacy of Old Phil's, the original, one of the Lilies estate here. And I, in thinking about that, how does Longwood, in your opinion, sort of straddle that world between looking to the past and being very respectful of the history that you're taking care of, but also being very innovative in your displays and doing things that Mr. DuPont might not have even been able to imagine originally? Well, you know, Charles, it's a, it's a really interesting question because um, it's actually um, the legacy of Mr. DuPont that is propelling us forward. And um, when we were going through the planning process that you, you referenced earlier, um, we spent a lot of time talking about Mr. DuPont, his legacy. And the one thing that we acknowledged is, is that we never wanted the long arm coming from the grave, so to speak. Um, and, and it was a scary evident. moment. I right, think. no, it, it is. And, and for this to be a family legacy, that's a, that's a, a very important moment. But um, what was evident is that um, Longwood has always been in a state of evolution, in a state of change. And even if we were to look at the time period of Mr. DuPont's brief moment now in time at Longwood, he was always changing and advancing his gardens. Nothing was ever, ever static. And so we've embraced his legacy and spirit as being one of innovation. And we have used that to really propel us in everything that we're doing now. And one of the, the other things I wanted to ask you to get started, and then we can take some questions from the audience, is that transition of Longwood over time included the legacy that Longwood was also free to the public at one time. Mm -hmm. And it didn't always have the visitor center that we now know where you come, there's a great berm if you haven't been there that hides the parking lot from the interior of the gardens, which is you know really interesting so you don't see parking. But it also means there's, a, there's one entrance where everybody's coming into the gardens um, with certain hours of time and day that you can come and, come and go. But from the transition, which happened quite a while ago, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could share a little bit of, you know, how that's worked out. And under your, you know, y'all just fairly recently, I think, instituted peak pricing even yeah. so that, you know, the sexier the event is, the higher the prices are with an mm -hmm. off-peak being $20 and peak being 27 and even more if you're mm -hmm. going to see fireworks or something. Right. 
Well, you know, there's a admission fees and pricing is, is always a dilemma for, for any cultural institution because the last thing that you want is to, to communicate that um, you're denying anyone access. And that's the challenge that all of us face. But um, Longwood was free at one point in its history. And I've been at Longwood for nine years now. And I uh, hope this doesn't worry you, Charles. But um, even to this day, that's that I hear people that come up to me and they go, gosh, I can remember when it was free. And or I can remember when it was 25 cents. And, and, but, but the thing that they usually follow that up with is, is that, but we understand. And, uh, and they understand it from our perspective of, about it, um, us um, being able to deliver an experience um, that's there and also to, um, to be able to advance our mission. And something, another piece of our history as it relates to admission um, fees is that actually during Mr. DuPont's time, he would open on special holidays like Easter and Mother's Day and whatnot, he would charge 25 cents. <laughs> and so it wasn't until after he died that it became free. Yeah. And so, <laughs> Another legacy you could right. draw upon, I suppose, right, right. to do things. Are there any questions from any of you? Yes? Speak about your budget and the components to make up your budget and the challenges you have with the um, Did everyone hear his question? He was asking about the components of our, our budget and, um, and some of the challenges that, that we have at Longwood. Uh, as Charles mentioned, our, our budget is roughly $50 million a year. Um, you could throw on another $11 million or so on top of that for capital projects, like the main fountain garden I just showed you. And so it's well in excess of $60 million a year of what, what we're working with. And we're a very unique situation in the fact that um, Mr. DuPont, from the very inception of Longwood, he knew that he wanted the gardens to be cared for long term. And he wanted Longwood to be the manifestation of his philanthropy. And so well before he died, he set up a foundation um, where all of his assets were, were placed. And uh, so it's from that legacy today, and now there are two foundations. Um, we are an operating foundation, and then there's a charitable foundation. And uh, but with the operating foundation, that endowment supports 50% of our operating budget, and then the charitable foundation provides the dollars for our capital projects. So that's a very unique situation. But it's also, um, our endowment is roughly around $730 million. And the other one is equally the same size. But uh, it's an interesting situation because we live by a rule at Longwood um, that is, we call it the 50-50 rule. The 50% of our operating budget will come from the endowment and we spend it 3.5% on a three-year rolling average and that's religious. And, and then the other 50% comes from earned revenue. We do no traditional fundraising as you know it. So every year, that's a, to my colleagues and I are responsible for earning through earned revenue uh, well in excess of $25 million through single ticket buyers, memberships, restaurant, retail, special events and fireworks like what Charles was, was talking about. And the question of philanthropy is really interesting because I thought that going to Longwood would be the, like the day, I was oh my gosh, they said we have this great money and we can do these wonderful things. But let me tell you, there's a myth about money and there's never enough. And the second piece is, is that um, not fundraising for us is actually um, a challenge because we have to work differently on how we connect to the needs of the community and how we know that we're fulfilling those needs and making an impact. To put that a little bit in context for us, for those of you who don't know, while that they're getting 50% of their budget off of money generated from an endowment, we're close to around 70%, and we have been higher in the past, like 72, 75%, um, and we're, now we're down, Jerry, to 69 or something like that, so we're moving, trying to move ourselves away from being as dependent, but it is very, very hard to do that once you become dependent on it, which is why we have, uh, you know, hopefully an ever-increasing, more robust um, development program to raise philanthropic dollars as well as to improve our ability to earn dollars um, by doing programming and ticket sales and cafes and other things. And, and that's difficult because Charles and I were talking earlier because actually um, eight years ago our budget was roughly the same and so we've worked towards this 50-50 ratio.
And how did, <clears throat> that might be interesting, just how did you do that in general in terms of, there must have been very hard decisions about what you're going to continue to do, what you're not going to do. Oh, um, oh sure. I mean, we had to stop doing a lot of things, but it was really our planning process that, that drove us forward and that provided that, that discipline. And so the generation of a lot of new ideas and what relevance means to a garden like Longwood in the 21st century came about. So, so the, the programs that we're doing um, now and how we're just representing our brand to, to the world, all of that has, has impacted that. And so this, our attendance has gone from 750,000 to the 1.2 million that it is that's impacted. Question? Yeah. This is real practical. We love the, the wall garden. It was just fantastic. How do you water? The, are you talking? Are you talking about the green wall? Yeah. So the she, restroom. yeah, the restroom. So she's asking about the the green wall I talked about. Um, I often say that um, it's the only restroom facility in the world that has its own team of docents, and, and it really does have its own team of docents. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's a, it is um, a a vertical system, and so there's um, tubing. That, that goes through to, to water everything and then it drains out and goes into our system. Um, would you talk a little bit about the uh, plan that you instituted starting in 206 and it took you several years to develop this new plan? Uh, I don't mean so much about the management here, we're talking about you know, <coughs> encouraging other people. But the, but the actual programs that you uh, instituted that drove your, have driven your attendance from <coughs> 700 million to you know, right. what were some of those programs? Well, she was asking about some of the programs we've done to help drive our attendance. Um, we are first and foremost a, a, a horticultural display garden, as Charles was saying, and so that drives all of our programming. So breathing new life and, um, and achieving what I call the releasing of the talent and the innovation at, at Longwood with the amazing horticultural professionals there to really let the creative juices just start flowing. And uh, so it was from that that um, new and refreshing ideas about our winter display with orchids and then the spring with the tulips and summer and fall with the chrysanthemums and the holiday show. Um, all of that really came, came forward on, on totally new levels. And one of the things that we do is that we encourage all of our staff to travel. I mean, so we're always traveling around the world looking for new and different things and taking ideas from, from other people and then bringing them back to Longwood and doing them in our way. How do you judge those new programs' success? What kind of metrics do you use to, to say that was a great success, we're going to continue to develop that as opposed to, well, we've done that three years in a row and we're not going to continue that? Right. Well, it's a, it's a, it, first and foremost, I mean, you do have to look at the, the bottom line, but also it's uh, about the, the mission and you're always weighing the, those two, two pieces. And so for education programs, so I mentioned the 60, 70 students we have at Longwood, it's a pretty e easy mission-based judgment call that, that we're making and how, how we're funding that because that is core to, to who we are. On the horticultural displays, we were talking about this earlier, um, there's nuances that we can achieve from a, a planning perspective. So the tulip bulbs that I showed you earlier, we have 300,000 plus tulip bulbs out there but the sequencing of how we plant them and the duration that we can get from them and even the sourcing of those could even impact how much we spend or even the number of rotations that we do with our displays in the conservatories or on our other what had been traditionally annual bedding areas at the gardens. Just those actions alone of changing a plant from being um, rotated out every two weeks to once every month um, could save hundreds of thousands of dollars for us. And then, and then also attend, I mean, just a response from our guests. I mean, if we present a show, a horticultural display, or present a new program, if our guests don't like it, we take it seriously and it's done. So are you surveying your guests frequently? All the, all the time. Um, we uh, actively seek the input and feedback from our guests. Um, we receive tens of thousands of surveys and we use that as an internal management tool to manage the experience. 
could you talk about how you're exploring uh, potential use of newer technology to enhance the experience there? I, know, I noticed that, well, I happened to be there last September. It was beautiful and back to place and enjoyed what you've done with the meadow. But I was curious as to how you're, you're looking at new technology to bring that to, to enhance experience. You must be an IT guy. No. No, you're not. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's, um, so he's asking about IT and what we're, how we're using IT. Um, we have been developing apps for special exhibits um, that we've been doing, and, uh, and those apps will often have um, embedded GPS systems so that people can find their way around the gardens, because, I mean, we have 500 acres, it's, it's complicated. And then just building that infrastructure to support that has, has been a task unto itself, but we've, we've gotten there. So that's the, the, easy, the easy piece. Um, the um, things that I would say that um, we are working on now are more of the interface experiences that we're looking at with iPhones, the web, how it's working, its adaptability, and then the even more audacious piece that we're in the pipeline of working on is how we, we have a, there's a whole part of Longwood that I say that it's underground because it's hidden in our archives. We have all of Mr. DuPont's original papers and documents about Longwood, and in addition to his um, historical um, horticultural book collection. And we don't tell that story at all, so we're currently walk, um, working on a program to bring that curated voice of our archival collections to the web. For the opposite of innovative technology, mm -hmm. I notice we have a number of horticultural volunteers here, and that's one of the things internally we've been talking about. How can we attract and manage and maintain and think volunteers appropriately? Mm -hmm. Because we, we're sure we're going to need to have more volunteers help, helping us advance the INA. And you all have 800 mm -hmm. plus at Longwood, and I, I'm guessing that you go back far enough and maybe there was a time when there were many fewer volunteers. But I don't oh, that. gosh, nine years ago um, when, when I started, I think that we had maybe 200 volunteers and there was actually a period in Longwood's history, um, recent history, where volunteers really weren't a part of the, the culture of, of Longwood. And uh, you don't know this, but my career, my first career and job that you mentioned at National Tropical Botanical Garden was as a volunteer coordinator. And so that's really how I cut my teeth professionally. You've coordinated 600 extra volunteers. And exactly. And so that was, they're very important to me. So when I came to Longwood, it was just in my DNA to support and build that, that facet. And we actually just had a volunteer recognition event last week. And uh, the energy, the enthusiasm, and also the knowledge, the expertise that they're bringing to us um, is without a doubt contributing to our success in keeping the, the staff motivated and morale positive, all that things. Yeah. What benefits do you offer your volunteers? Oh gosh, um, we, we, if you volunteer for a number of hours, and I, I, don't, I can't remember what the number of hours is, but then you get a membership level, so free, free access. And uh, then we're always um, presenting continuing education classes for them. And then we do other special events for them throughout the year. And it really depends on where you are. We have a really unique volunteer system in that it's decentralized. And so we have the 800 volunteers. We have one volunteer coordinator for those 800 volunteers. And we've designated um, staff leads within all divisions who serve as the volunteer coordinators in the sections of horticulture and facilities and our archives and library. And they do their own benefit structures and recognition um, things for volunteers as well. And then we actually delegate and give our volunteers a lot of liberty to just make decisions and do things on their own too, which helps to support that. Sure. Actually, two questions. One is the follow-up to the one on technology. Yeah. How are you managing your Oh, that's a, and secondly, in terms of Really good question. So she was asking about technology on the side of what I would position as sustainability and energy in, in that piece, and then asked about uh, artistic installations and work that we do, and then there was a 
like your Bruce Monroe program. Right. So on the technology side, uh, one of the things that we achieved uh, about three years ago now is that we installed a 1.6 megawatt solar facility. And that's providing about 30% of our annual electrical need. All of our other electric is hydropower. So it's essentially all, all green now. We actually wanted to go to three megawatts of solar energy, and that would take us off the grid completely on a sunny day for like eight hours. Um, but the Pennsylvania solar credit market dropped right when we were ready to do that second half. So that's on our to-do to list. Um, the artistic installations is an interesting question. I mean, that's actually a new area for us. And so as Charles was asking about some of the new programs that we're doing and how we measure success, um, one of the things that we embarked upon in this new plan was new experiences through artistic installations. And uh, our um, objective in that is that we want people to see gardens through a different lens. And one of the lenses that we've been exploring is the garden at night. And one of the first major exhibits that we did that is an artistic installation was a, a UK lighting artist by the name of Bruce Monroe, and he works with fiber art, op optic art. And so we were his first um, display and exhibit in North America. Um, I guess it's been two years ago now. And it was extraordinarily beautiful because for us, we want the art to be secondary to the gardens and, and to the landscape and to the flowers. And we achieved that with it. And our, our guests love that. We had record attendance. We're um, going to have an exhibit this summer and next summer that is with a, an artist out of Philadelphia, and he works with digital mapping. So maybe you've seen the projections that people do on buildings, and they make the buildings change forms and shape and shift. Um, we challenged um, Ricardo to work with our plant collection. And so he's actually using the canvas of our historic trees, the canopy of the forest, and he's using some of our iconic historic trees, um, our topiary, and our gardens in the conservatories for his digital mapping. And um, it's really quite astonishing. It's indescribable because when you see this, the plants really are coming to life and become a different kind of third dimension. Um, you, really, you really have to see this. You can't describe it. And as part of this, we've commissioned, and Ricardo commissioned, um, specially composed music for each installation. And so you'll be able to experience this at nighttime at long. And again, just about the IMA, we have actually been considering when and how we also might be able to work with a contemporary artist to do a, a, a land installation, probably up on this side, um, particularly now that we're able to more easily control the way people enter the campus and move, which would be nearly impossible to do with an artist if you people were entering from all directions. Mm -hmm. Two part question on transportation. How, how can you get to the gardens without taking a car? And then how do you move people around the gardens? So he asked about transportation, getting people to Longwood and moving them in the gardens. And with 500 plus acres, that's a, the movement is a challenging. And especially in the Brandywine Valley, which is really becoming a retirement community for people moving from Manhattan and Washington, D.C. And, and New Jersey. Um, it's like Sun City now. Um, but, uh, but Longwood actually logistically is a challenge for us um, because there is no mass transit to Longwood Gardens. You can take the train to Wilmington, Delaware and then catch a cab, 12 mile ride out to Longwood, but then it's getting the cab to come back out to Longwood to take you back to the train station that's, that's the challenge. And then there's a perception of residents of Center City Philadelphia that we are way, way, way out in the country when it's actually, we're only 45 minutes from Central City, Philadelphia. And so there's a tremendous challenge there in overcoming the lack of public transportation to us. Um, and some of the things that we're doing to overcome that is that we're partnering with Zipcar in Philadelphia and we've sponsored cars and they are flower cars and um, there are special Longwood cars that um, people get special rates to come out to Longwood. Moving people internally, that's a really big deal because we don't want those vehicles interfering with the guest experience because some of them can be really nasty, um, just in their appearance, but even just in how they sound. And uh, we found these new electric carts, and I actually saw them in a garden in Shanghai that are beautiful and they're quiet. And we purchased our first ones last year for the meadow, and we're using that as a trial 
to run people from a position from inside the core of the garden to a remote house that's part of the meadow that's a historic house that dates back to 1710 that's an interpretive center. And we're using that as a shuttle for people who can't access the meadow to get to that far point and to see it. So far, the trial is going really, really well. The challenge for us now is how to expand that to the rest of the garden, and, but we know we want it to be on the perimeter so that it has specific stops so that people can go in it like that. What percentage of walk? Excuse me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes. the vast majority of yes. visitors walk through your garden. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And we have, we have scooters and wheelchairs and all that stuff. Or, uh, we, have, we have an army of scooters that, that people can, can rent or have for free. Electric cars, how many people can be on the car? Well, on, well, cart. cart. Yeah, cart. It's just a one person scooter. Yeah. And then the, the, with the cart that we have to move people, that, that can hold. 20, 25 people? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is basically what our new garden train that starts have, have, on Thursday holds, 24. Yeah, and they're actually um, wheelchair accessible. They're very quiet, you know, you, you can pull, you know, they're ventilated or not, I mean, they're, they're really first class and then you can place a benefit. Yeah, they're so quiet when they drive by my house, that's what, and I'm working in the garden, I don't see those guests. <laughs> That's how quiet they are. Yes. Can you talk about, you mentioned the library. Can you talk a little bit about She's the library. She's a virtual library. I'm a virtual library. Sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the library and the history of the library? Yes. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about that? Oh, sure. Well, we, we actually have an ex, a great library at Longwood, and it's a, it's a resource library. It's not a, a lending library, and uh, it was based upon Mr. DuPont's horticultural collection and, and his books and archives related to, to Longwood and some other DuPont fam, family members. And we have been building that library and focusing on our centers of excellence in horticulture, the various sectors of horticulture, even facilities, so engineering, electrical engineering, plumbing, greenhouse construction, um, fireworks, fountains, and fountain technology, collecting resources and periodicals on all, all of those things, and then uh, more recently on land stewardship and in conservation. And so it's not accessible to our guests or to the public, it's actually hidden back of, of house, which is unfortunate, and it's a small facility. Our volunteers and staff have full access to it. And um, we really long term want to make it accessible to our guests. And, but we have to wait to have a new facility for that. But we thought, how could we connect our guests to it in a really meaningful way? And so our um, library manager, who is uh, very creative, came up with an idea to, for us to lead a community read project, and, or a, a big read, as, as we called it. And we recruited all the regional land conservation and land stewardship organizations in southeastern Pennsylvania and in Delaware and New Jersey. And then we aligned ourselves with all the public libraries and schools. And we selected our first book last year, and it was a wonderful book um, by, um, about Aldo Leopold and the Sand County Almanac. And that was the first um, community read. And we had a series of public programs, and we also developed um, curriculum K through 12 so the teachers could use the book um, in, in their classrooms. And we did this for free. I mean, we just gave this back to the community. But the capstone um, project was um, a, a panel discussion with a, um, a biographer of Aldo Leopold and then various conservation leaders plus our own talent. We had 200, 250 people there for this thing. And so it was really important in positioning us as conservation thought leaders. This. Um, last year, we did a book called Braiding Sweetgrass. So again, continuing the land conservation and connecting it to Native Americans. Um, next year, we're going to do a um, community read with um, a book, and I can't remember the name of it. Some of you may, it's the grandma who, the first um, person to walk the Appalachian Trail from beginning to end, grandma, such and such. And um, she was the one that really saved the Appalachian Trail and created it into what it is today, and that's our next community read. It's become wildly successful in a very short period of time. And a wonderful way for us to, to connect people with a part of our mission 
that um, otherwise they wouldn't even know about. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Following up on the sustainability thing, can you talk about what you do relative to water and uh, chemicals? Oh, sure. Well, this is, um, it's a, even though our founder has a con connection to better living through chemical, um, <laughs> that's a, to, that is not our mantra at Longwood Gardens. Uh, we are, we're not quite completely organic and totally chemical free. I mean, you still have to use the best control for, for the problem. But um, I would say that we're probably 95% of the way there. And that uh, we've done an extraordinary job on that level. Um, and we have a whole integrated pest management team. That, that's what they work on and, and do. Um, and we're even leading research in, in that area. Uh, on the um, sustainability side of water, um, we are actually a self-contained system at Longwood. I mean, you can imagine all the, the fountains that we have and the, the water that's required there. So we actually have our own wastewater treatment plant. And uh, we have our own well and water tower. And so it's a contained system with everything that goes down and out is recycled back through and comes back in. And we even have the EPA and state license and permits that we can use that treated water in our fountains and for irrigation. Yeah, and, and Longwood did that a long time ago, and I can't take credit for that. And the other thing that we do on the water conservation standpoint is that we have some very impressive um, um, controls, and I think you mentioned some of the work you're doing for parking lots here. We have a number of wetlands around Longwood where we can divert the drainage from those parking lots into these wetlands to feed them and to nurture the birds, wildlife, and flowers that are in those areas and to keep those wetlands going. What's involved in becoming a World Heritage Site? She was asking about what's involved in becoming a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Ask me in six months again and I'll tell you. <laughs> It's, a, it's something that, that you should really place on your radar. It's, I think those of you who've traveled around the world, you've probably heard of the UNESCO sites and whatnot. It really has been, I think, more important to internationals and in using it as a travel tool. And here in the United States, I think over the next 10 years, and, and I think over this next year, you're going to hear announcements about um, North American sites being designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Philadelphia is working on something right now. Just Longwood is a National Historic Landmark, just right. like part of our property is here, as well as the Miller House is another one. Another one. It was one other. Just a small curiosity, but when you talk about the big increase in volunteers, but is there, what's the difference in the ratio to the size of the Well, our staff, is the everyday staffing is right around 400, give or take, so 20 or so. So the ratio really changed from, so, when, so, so the ratio is really, it's really massive growth on both sides. Right. Staff, and volunteers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's and we're actually getting ready to go to 1,000 people. Yeah. 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 And we're actually getting ready to go through a, a growth spurt on our staffing side. Because with the launch of our new main fountain garden in 2017, we're fairly confident that our attendance will hit upwards to 1.5 million guests. And so we really need to prepare our internal um, guest services and horticulture staff as well for that. And I suspect our volunteers pool will go up with that incrementally. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you offer like daily programming on the grounds and for birds and like the birds and the interpreters or tours or and do you see if that ties into your we are open 365 days a year and we so we never close it takes a blizzard before we close and we have pro some degree of programming going on every day and uh, I know that uh, Charles asked about the programming and the things that we're doing I mean that's that stuff is definitely helping to drive our membership and attendance but I know without a doubt what's really at the heart of what's driving the loyalty and people coming to Longwood and the numbers they are it's the quality of the experience and the guest service that, that we're delivering. And then it's our frontline staff and guest service associates that are playing that role with interpretation and connecting people with our story that in a personal way, one-on-one -on -one way, that is driving that. Is it like um, scheduled programming like at noon there's a tour of you know, a certain section of the Absolutely. Oh yeah, no, we're doing some really fun things. I mean, we do a behind-the-scenes tour of our boiler room. 
Oh yeah, I mean, people are fascinated by, by. I mean, that's one of the things people want to know. They want to know how we do what we do at Longwood. You know, the book, how things work. I mean, that's, that's in people's heads, and so we take them back into our boiler room. We have a whole system of underground tunnels um, across our campus and underneath the conservatories. We put hard hats on our guests and take them into the tunnels. Um, our open air theater, uh, we have this beautiful amphitheater our founder designed. The original restrooms, uh, restrooms and dressing rooms are still in place, and it is a history of performing arts of the early 20th century down there. Martha Graham, others performed there. We take them down to the area that our, most of our guests never see. And so it's those little things that are really making a difference. And how would access to those wonderful behind the scenes snapshots into how Longwood works, on, on the front end, are those open to everybody who buys admission and shows up at 12 o'clock? Sure. Or are they, you're a member at a certain level or do certain things to? Uh, it's a, those we open up to, to anybody. And it's a, there's a capacity because of space sure. constraints. And once the capacity is filled, done. And then we do other things like in our conservatories and out in the gardens, like on the asking about chemicals and, and use our IPM staff. Um, who do the research um, um, with our um, natural predators that we release to control other insects. He brings out all of his bugs in containers and shows them to, to the, the kids and guests. And something that we're, we're doing that's really fun right now that I'm proud of, I mentioned the main fountain garden project that we're working on. This garden is really truly in the, the heart, the center of Longwood. When you come out of our conservatories, it's what you see in, in Standover. Um, when we were embarking upon this construction project, we thought this is totally going to impact our guests. We've got to hide this thing. It's going to detract from the beautiful experience we want to provide. And we decided, why are we going to apologize for this thing? That we are actually making an enormous investment in this legacy garden. And so let's show it off and let's tell the story about what, we've doing, what we're doing. So we have opened up the entire construction site for people to see it. And we've built an entire interpretive center around it. And we have artifacts from the garden there, um, talking about the stone restoration process. And we've trained docents and guest service associates to connect people with that. Once we get some of the form of the garden in place, on the weekends, we're going to do hard hat tours of the construction site. Thank you. I was really going to actually follow up with that question, how we can make that appeal. And, and that has been the most pleasant surprise. Um, it is a huge experiment about opening up this construction site and to see how people would react to it. And the, the moment when I knew it was going to work and it was doing what we wanted it to do was um, one day a couple weeks ago, I saw these two guests and it was obviously a grandmother and a grandson. And they were standing at the railing overlooking this construction site. They were there for 20 minutes. And the grandson was captivated by the big trucks, the diggers, <laughs> everything going on. I mean, it, it was wonderful. I'd love that. Yeah. Is there a point where the staff come up with a really good pushing envelope kind of idea that you draw a line that is concerned about the conservation of the property and the experience? What's the idea to come about that you push back? What's hit the cutting room floor? She's she's asking. What sort of programs are really innovate if you said no and we're worried about the property here? We actually we so ideas that have hit the cutting room floor. Um, we embarked upon this um, this very uh, unique project of partnering with a, a local theater company and it was People's Light and Theater Company written up in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, it's a wonderful group. They do original works. And we partnered together and we thought, gosh, let's go after an innovation grant with the William Penn Foundation to marry your theatrical people with all of our plant people at Longwood Gardens to see what kind of um, new piece of theater could be developed inspired by Longwood's story and the story of horticulture. And these were Tony Award winning teams of people that were working on this stuff. And one of the ideas, um, that came out, um, and I don't want to say the name of it because I don't want it to get out in the world of, of theater, but this particular group wanted to install a big top um, at Longwood and had this whole acrobatic thing and it was wild connection to flowers and whatnot. And it was in this one particular garden and that's when we just said, no, no. No, we, we do draw the line. You have to. <laughs> 
Well, it is exactly seven o'clock, and I want to ask one question, I guess is our last question, which may seem a little simple-minded, but you know, we, we're having an internal conversation about what kind of garden are we? Are we an estate garden? Are we a display garden? Are we a botanical <coughs> garden? Or, and I think for most of us, when we look at your images, and certainly if you've been to Longwood, you just say it's one of the greatest botanical gardens in the world, but you don't call yourself a botanical garden. No. And I'd love to hear, since you spent the day going through our garden and through the park, sort of what would you advise us perhaps on, should we worry about what we call ourselves or just That's a really good seize question, the day yeah. and call ourselves? Because I, I was discussing this with some of the, the team members and your colleagues today. Um, I don't think you should worry about it. Um, that's a, gardens come in all shapes and sizes and names can put a label on something, and especially when you use the word botanical, um, botanic, um, that has a connotation of um, academic rigor, academic research, um, collections management standards. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that are there. I mean, Arboretum, Arboretum, I mean, go on and on. Um, for Longwood, we're a garden. And that's really what we're setting out to be as a, a garden that is beautiful and world class. And we're defining it in our own way. And, and that's one of the wonderful things about this profession that I work in, and now that Charles is <coughs> diving into it in the world of gardens, is that it's diverse. Um, there are, I drove by today a beautiful cemetery, and I'm coming by that all of you probably know. Um, there are cemeteries in the United States that are gardens and designated, and they participate in my world of gardens and Arboretum. and they're members of um, our professional association. And I think that you actually have a wonderful opportunity with your property and grounds and gardens here because you can define it for what you want it to be. And you don't have to use botanical, botanic, display garden, um, I, I think it's a fair playing field and you can define it for yourself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get hung up on it and I would keep it simple. Can, can, can keep it simple and true to what it, is, what it is and that's why you heard me talking about we're about beauty at Longwood. We t spent a lot of time talking about that and I can talk about the research and conservation and other things that we're doing but at the end of the day we're creating a beautiful world and that's what our guests want to experience. It's that simple perfect way to end a perfect talk. Thank you very much.